we're going to be looking at Psalm 95 and Psalm 96. Um, it's the portion of our uh, short uh, look at what is known as the apocalyptic psalms. These psalms are an incredible string of 10 psalms and they, they speak of the time uh, near the end. And uh, they speak most wonderfully also of the Lord's kingdom right at the end in, in Psalm 100. And, uh, and that's the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's doctrine that's right through this and it's qu pretty incredible to see it. These next two messages, and I know that I promised that I was only going to do one more on this, but as I went through this, I, I, I thought, I, I can't, I can't do it justice to just do one more. Um, these next two messages are going to be directed, not, not to you, dear Christian, necessarily. Um, I pray that it might be a blessing to you, that you might be able to receive something from it. But these next two messages are going to be, are going to be specifically for those who are left behind. Um, and when we speak of this, we'll, we'll, we'll explain that a little bit more as I go through. Something else that's a little bit different with respect to this particular message, I'm going to be doing something that I've never done before, and that is, which is always dangerous. It's always dangerous, and I, and I admit that. Um, but there is going to be a certain degree of narrative through this short story. Um, it's something that I had written, something that I wanted to take through the eyes of someone who discovers that, that she is actually indeed left behind. And, and so in that respect, it is directed to those who are still here during the time of, of the tribulation, or sp most specifically during the time after the church has been, has been taken by the Lord. So the narrative itself is a fictional account of what may very well be someone's future reality. Uh, it's a reality that will find them left behind to endure the most terrific events of history. Um, a period that we know as the seven-year period known as the tribulation in the Bible. So I'm praying that this sermon will encourage uh, those of you who are looking for the glorious appearing of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for that blessed hope that we have to look forward to, and that is the rapture of the church. Um, but also that it would challenge you for the urgency of the gospel, that it would challenge you for the most important thing that we could be doing and that we could be spending our time right now, that we could recognise and understand that what we are sharing is true and that we would share it with the most urgent of appeals to those who are here um, and I pray that you will be considering those that would be fewer and fewer left behind simply because of the words that you would share with them. So let's read together with, with Psalm 95, we'll read that in whole, Psalm 96 we're only going to be looking at uh, the last handful of verses after verse 10. But Psalm 95 has a, an interesting application for us in how it's broken up specifically to, to this section and to this, this story that I'm going to be putting out. And, and I hope it's a blessing. I really do hope it's a blessing for you. Uh, they're not incredibly long, the, uh, the, the story line, but, um, but I pray that it would, uh, it, would, it would just bring something to our minds. Psalm 95, let's read together. Psalm 95, it begins, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is, also, is his also. The sea is his and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. And as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation." 
and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath they should not enter into my rest. Let's pray. Father, a time, dear Lord, that the appeal that we make this morning is to those who might indeed be left behind. Those, dear Father, who have discovered themselves to be, uh, to be left to undergo a time of trouble, dear Lord, that, um, that has never been before. And I ask and I pray, dear Lord, no matter when someone listens to this message, no, when, no matter when someone sees it, dear Lord, I ask and I pray, dear Father, that they would take heed, that they would take warning, that they would consider of it, and that in every way, Lord, they may turn and believe the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, that today is the day in which there is a hope for them. Today, if they would hear his voice, that they would not harden their hearts. So I ask you, dear Lord, please that you would be with me and let this be a profound message for those who are left behind. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I go through this, I'm going to be breaking it up with a little bit of exposition on the text that we're looking at. But at first account, you're going to notice that it is a um, that is in large part a story. The first section of Psalm 95 tells about an invitation and gives an invitation to people, but it gives the invitation with reason. The second portion from from uh, verse seven through to verse eleven, it also continues the invitation, but that invitation is given with warning. The subject of the passage, most importantly, is directed to the Jews. We see that also given to us in the book of Hebrews, which is a slight commentary on this this particular passage. It was an early, early morning for her, but not intended to be early. She craved more than anything just to sleep. Her mind was still reeling over the events of the last few months. During the middle of the night, however, she was startled by a loud sound. It didn't come from inside her home. It was not a noise of anything being disturbed. On the contrary, the sound was a beautiful harmony, a sound of a range of wind instruments, bugle, trombone, trumpet, or even flute. It wasn't anything she had heard before, but it was loud and clear and yet lovely. Unsure if it was just a dream, she tried to turn back to the sleep she was finally enjoying till that moment. But after several hours wrestling, she got out of bed. Being up so early, she was not surprised that she could finally flick the kettle on and boil water the old-fashioned way, rather than heat water over a flame. During normal times, when most people are up, her low citizen score would not permit her to use the kettle, which would spike energy consumption that she was not privileged to receive. Peak time power was reserved for those with a score above 600. Never did she think that the smart meter installed years ago by her power company could individually select items to turn on or off based on her behaviour and the so-called green energy's ability to supply. Today, this just happened to remind her of things her brother had been saying about the Bible and end times. Friends from work mentioned it too, and these are friends that aren't even religious. Her brother told her Jesus was coming to judge the world, but before that happens, a number of things will occur. Control of outcome was one of those things, and she hated it. Her name is Sue. She's single and lives alone a few suburbs away from different members of her family. Her brother told her a lot about God since he became a believer almost 20 years earlier. But she wasn't ready to accept God. Yes, she'd come to understand that everything on the earth was made and didn't come from nothing, but she didn't like the idea that she would be judged for her sin. She did not ever like being told what she could and could not believe. In verse 4 to 6 of our text, Psalm 95 says, In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. It concludes an invitation to the lost and it does so with reason. It speaks of why we sing praise 
to God. It speaks of his, of his power as the creator. It speaks of him as our maker. And it will require all our humility. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Sue, like m- many like her, find this the most challenging of all. And yet we are to be as little children. We are to be humble and contrite. Sue picked up her phone, ignoring the now permanent breaking news banner on the home screen. She hates that she can't turn it off. She'd get a dumb phone just for that if there were any companies still selling them. She checks her social media page and discovers that the Commonwealth Bank, the last bank in Australia, has been taken over by the government. It doesn't make any difference, she thinks. There are no branches left since the collapse and when everything went completely digital. Funny. Her brother told her that we were headed to a cashless society, but Sue never thought a virus could make it happen so quickly. Within two years, almost every company stopped taking cash. The broken ATMs never got repaired, and the branches began closing in the suburbs one after another. The collapse happened two years ago now, and Sue is really struggling to cope with the limitations of how much money she is allowed to use each week. It's not only barely, it's only barely enough to live on. It's not fair that her own deposits were given to the bank simply because the bank took too many risks. Yet again, her brother warned her about something called bail-in way back in 2018. And the risk that a coming great mortgage default would put all our money at risk. This wouldn't have been a problem if you had cash to withdraw. Now almost every country in the world has only one bank, the central bank. With no cash transactions, there was no need for branches, just a better computer system. Nobody really has savings either anymore. People who had money in the bank now had to pay interest instead of getting interest. And they couldn't do anything about it since they banned cash. With negative interest rates, it wasn't long before people realised that it was better to borrow money and pay back less than you owe than it was to deposit money and get back less than you're owed. So now everyone just lives day to day. Such a weird upside down world, she thought. Her brother tried to tell her that things are going to get really strange, even upside down, where good is bad and bad is good. She didn't believe that that was possible, but now she's starting to see it. It was what will happen in the last days, he said. But it all sounded too negative. She just turned off mentally and tried not to listen. Maybe I need to look at this more closely, she tells herself. Even if half of what he said is true, I need to see what I can do. It's 7am. She knows her brother would be on his way to work. She places the call, but the phone just rings out. For the last 2,000 years, Christians who know their Bibles have been anticipating one event, an event known as the rapture of the church. An event prior to what the Bible refers to as the Great Tribulation. It's a coming seven year period of literal hell on earth. Jesus coming for his church is seen again and again in the Bible as an imminent event. An event that can literally occur at any time. Nothing needs to happen before it. It's for this reason it must be before the evident sign of the beginning of that seven year tribulation period, the sign where Antichrist himself makes a covenant with many respecting Israel. That is the sign of the tribulation period. No one can rightly teach the rapture can happen only after or during the tribulation if this event is imminent. It can't be taught any other way. Paul's wrote it, Paul wrote of it in First Thessalonians. Turn there, turn there with me. First Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, an incredible passage and it makes it really, really clear what he is referring to. And I would, you, I would have you consider he is speaking to his brethren who had believed and thought that, well, they had missed this important event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul writes this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning them which are asleep, 
Now that refers to being dead in Christ. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Prevent simply means go before, prevent. That was the old way of referring to the word prevent. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul speaks of himself in the first person, plural, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, taken up. This is the word that's been translated into the Latin as raptured or rapturo. It's taken up and it's the word that we employ when we speak about this honestly fantastic event. And it's impossible to miss the imminency of the expectation in this text alone. Is it a strange event? It's the strangest event. It's not something that any of us can properly explain. Um, But it's not an unusual event. It's not something that hasn't happened before in Scripture. It also occurred when Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. That Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire in 2 Kings Chapter 2, verse 11. Lot and his family were taken as a type out of Sodom before fire and brimstone destroyed her and the cities about her. God simply will not destroy the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous are as the wicked. There's a separation that's being done that the righteous are separated from the wicked and God is not going to be destroying or likening the righteous with the wicked. So it's impossible to consider this as potentially the church going through the tribulation. Genesis 18, 23 to 25 gives the logical understanding of it. Philip was caught away in the book of Acts respecting the Ethiopian official in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. Paul was caught up to the seventh heaven. John the apostle spoke of a similar event occurring to him in the book of Revelation. So this isn't new. Though the rapture of the church is specifically noted in the New Testament. It's got an interesting passage in the Old Testament. Have a look with me in Isaiah chapter 26. Turn there. Turn there with me. The context is absolutely astounding because the context is indeed prior or speaks of something that is going to happen upon the earth. Interesting separation that it speaks of and it links so perfectly well with the Lord making a place for us. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 20 to 21. He says, Come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Here, there is a people, God's people, who are to come and to hide themselves in a place that's been prepared for them. Not forever, but as it were for a little moment. They how long? Well, until the indignation be overpassed. What indignation? Well, this is the indignation on the earth. This is something that God is going to undertake, that he's going to come to the earth and to judge the world. This is what the Bible refers to as the day of vengeance of our God or the day of God's wrath, also known notably as the day of Jacob's trouble. This is a time where God again begins dealing with the Jews. Here is what is happening. This is the purpose for it. Throughout the Bible, the coming judgment upon the world is given in this description by the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives a description. Jesus gives a description of what those days are going to be like. He says in Matthew 24, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There will be those who are taken up. Oh, and that is all those who believe the gospel prior to that rapture event. And this is there so you don't need to be left behind. If, if you are still here and you don't know the Lord and the rapture has not occurred, obviously as I'm preaching this message, then this sermon is for you. If it's too late, however, if the rapture of the church has occurred when you watch or hear this message, then please know that this sermon is for you. It's, it's not the end yet, and it's not hopeless yet. The first part of Psalm 95 gives an invitation to the people. It's an invitation with reason. It gives you a reason. It gives an understanding of that reason. It says, O come, <coughs> let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God. This is now the reason. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is also is his also. The sea is his and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. It's a psalm that commands both evident reason for coming to the Lord, but also a requirement for incredible humility. It requires humility. We cannot come to the Lord without humility. That's what it speaks about there. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. It's pride. Pride that prevents the vast majority of people coming to the Lord. It was pride that prevented the Jews from accepting the Lord Jesus Christ the first time. And that pride is what prevented our character in the story here from believing the gospel. She was made aware that God is and has come to accept the truth of it, but she refused to humble herself, claiming only that she's not ready. But sadly and tragically, time seems to have escaped her. Something's occurred. Something has moved beyond the most opportune times for her. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Sue had never really gotten sick before. She's over 40 years of age, healthy, looks after herself well and can't understand why she's been getting progressively unwell over the last few years. Colds last longer. The muscle aches from general exercise take longer to recover. And she's been getting headaches in varying severity from dull to very strong for some time. Today is one of those days. She tried calling her brother again, but again, no answer. She links into her doctor's online clinic to request a confirmation code for paracetamol to click and collect. She places a few other orders with the stores online and confirms a time that she'll be home to receive it all. She remembers when going shopping was a treat and time to get out. Now she can't even get Panadol without a prescription. She needs to wait at home now to be identified for drone deliveries of prescribed drugs. Thinking it's so strange that her brother was not answering her calls that morning, she tries one last time before calling her sister-in-law to see if everything's okay. But no answer there also. Strange. She calls her niece, but the same result. Her nephew and just gets a please leave a message. Before she puts her phone down, another breaking news item appears and she chooses to ignore it. Far too much news continues to give her anxiety and even more headaches. Something triggered a memory of her niece telling her about her faith and what she believed. She loved her niece, but these conversations always got her on edge. She had tried them, she had heard them so often during the years, and the more she heard them, the more she turned off. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. This is one of the greatest risks of those unwilling to hear the gospel. Their hearts get 
hardened and making the truth of the gospel even more difficult to receive. And this is anticipated in Psalm 95. We harden our hearts today, if you will hear his voice. Harden not your hearts. Be willing, be open to accept the truth. But the more you hear the gospel and the more you turn off, the more your heart is going to be hardened. Nevertheless, her niece talked about how much she is looking forward to Jesus coming for her. Sue thought this strange at the time because she thought her niece was talking about dying and going to heaven, not anything else. But her niece clarified that it wasn't dying that comforted her. It was the chance that Jesus would come to literally take her to heaven. But not only her, her whole family and all her Christian friends. She called it the rapture. Suddenly, Sue remembered another conversation with her brother a few years earlier, and he spoke about this. And that the world has already come up with ways of hiding it if it happens. He said they might even say something like aliens took us. Sue remembers thinking it was out of his mind. Just as the thought came to her mind, however, she tried calling him again. But again, no answer. She decided to head over to his house. Fortunately, her number plates had an even number and being Tuesday, she was allowed to travel by car. Only people with electric cars can travel every day. Her hybrid car, however, had limits. Gasoline cars stopped being produced five years ago and were finally banned last year due to climate change. She got to the suburban checkpoint, scanned the embedded VAC pass to the authorised personnel, drove into the street and was surprised to see her brother's car home. Coming to the door, she noted the drone delivered essentials on the porch. This is a standard delivery each day of 500 mils of milk, a small loaf of bread, with a few other selectable additions. Sue still laments the food rationing. It was supposed to be temporary after the virus disrupted the food food chain, but it's been three years already. She rings the bell, no answer. Rings again and again, no answer. She takes out her own key to the home and goes inside, calling out, but there is no response. All she can hear is several phone wake-up alarms. Sue heads into the main bedroom, notes that the beds look slept in, the curtains are still closed, but is astounded to find both her brother and her sister-in-law's phones by the bedside table, ringing their respective alarms. She turns off the alarms on both, both phones. Notes again, breaking news banners on her sister-in-law's phone, but ignores it. Her brother has one of the last dumb phones, so no irritating breaking news banner is seen on his phone. She heads out into the yard. On the way, she hears another phone alarm coming from her niece's bedroom. Going inside her room, Sue again sees the curtains closed. She turns off the phone alarm, opens the curtains, and picks up the Bible laying open on her niece's bed. Sue wonders what her niece was reading and found this highlighted text. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. That last part had a double underline. That passage that Sue just read is a commentary on Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11. It hadn't really dawned on Sue that she had just missed the rapture of the church. She recognised God's work in the world and she had been told about the Lord by her family time and again, but instead of turning to what she knew was true, she hardened her heart and she continued to harden her heart. Paul in the Hebrews passage identifies a limitation of time. Notice this. He says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. There is a limitation of the time. And again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, As it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I'm pleading with you that are listening to this. Please do not harden your hearts to this. 
be open, be objective, be critical, but also at the same time, be logical in your considerations. There is not that time available for any of us. And this is a time that is most important. The passages that we're looking at from Psalm 91 to 100 lay out a series of events to a degree with respect to the coming of the Lord. But there is a time that the church will be gone. The church will be taken up. And it is an incredible thing to consider and yet the Bible presents it as factually true. Israel had seen the works of God. They identified it. They recognized it. They knew that it was the Lord and it was not God hiding himself. It was the hardness of the heart that prevented them turning to him. Friends, we are not to wait for a feeling like Sue. We are not to wait for a time when we can personally identify with the idea or personally accept the idea. This isn't about preference. This is about that which is true. It's not about our personal preference. We're not talking about ice cream here. We're talking about that which is objectively and realistically true. And if you see that the church is gone and there are excuses made about it, then it is time to consider the truth of this and to soften your heart and to believe the gospel. All people know God exists. All people do, or at least they did. It's simply understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1 verse 20. All people know that they would not be seen as perfect in the eyes of God, who also knows the hearts of every individual. He knows the hearts of all people. Well, we can hide our sins from our neighbour. We can hide our sins even from our family members. But we cannot even hide the thoughts and intents of our hearts from God. God knows the heart. All people are therefore commanded to believe the gospel. That Jesus died for their sins. And that if they believe in their hearts that Jesus, that Jesus died and rose again, they would be saved. In this, Jesus demonstrated that he took the wages of their sin that he took that which was due for their payment and that he took them and he died respecting them. And it was his rising from the dead that signified to all people newness of life. He defeated death on the cross. He defeated death. And it's one of those things that are so continually rejected by the world and yet all the evidence is to the contrary. The evidence that Jesus died on that cross and that he rose again is so profound that it transformed the lives of billions of people around the world. And it wasn't a lie that was performed. Unlike now where you see people actually doing kamikaze missions, dying for what they think that they believe, let's recognize and remember that all of the apostles died as a result of preaching Christ rose from the dead and that he lived. They died preaching that Christ lived. They died preaching that Christ lived. These are the only individuals, including the witnesses that were about them, that would have known the truth. And there is no man who would die for what he knows to be a lie. None. No person is willing to die for what they know to be a lie. The apostles' transformed life is found so evident in the Bible. They changed and transformed the world because of their zeal for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as a result of that, the evidence in the changed hearts of those who have believed, the transformed lives, people who were, who were, who were thieves and now become honest individuals, people who would, who would kill now shy away so drastically from that idea. Those people have transformed lives. They experienced Christ had changed them. They are a testimony to the truth of this also. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Incredibly, if however the church is gone, though the terrible period to endure is still ahead, the torment of it can be temporary if and only if today you will hear his voice and harden not your hearts. The gospel can still save you, but time is short. 
If you've entered into this tribulation period, the entire period lasts for only seven years before Jesus Christ actually returns and judges the earth. It ramps up dramatically at the three and a half year point. Antichrist has already been revealed. The temple is already built and is in Jerusalem. He has made a covenant with many respecting Israel. There is likely to have been a dramatic war that might have precipitated this particular event. A war with Russia, Iran, Turkey coming against Israel to completely wipe them off the map. That might have already happened. If it hasn't happened, watch out for it because the Bible teaches that that is going to occur. And the entire world is going to come against Israel. The Bible also teaches that is going to occur. The entire world will hate Israel. Israel, why don't you consider this? Israel is less than a fifth of the size of the state of Victoria. And yet it is in the news almost every single day. The Bible says Israel will be a thorn in the side of all nations. Incredible how that's presented itself as true. It's not by accident. It's because God has made sure he, under, he, he taught that this would happen, that when you see it happen, you would believe. That's why prophecy is given in Scripture. Prophecy is put in Scripture not, not just for the sake of fortune-telling. It's there that when you see it occur, you would believe. And there is an enormous amount of things that are still to occur that the Bible teaches. And one of those things is what is outlined already in this text and in this story, and that is the coming of a digital single currency. It's amazing how Christians have been talking about it for years and years and years and no one had believed them. And we're living at a time right now where it is very, very, very likely. Psalm 96, as we begin to wrap up this message this morning. Psalm 96 verse 10, Say among the heathen, that the Lord reigneth. Notice the focus. It's among the heathen now. And this is interesting, again, because the tribulation period is to be dealing with the heathen. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh. He cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Sue fell down onto the side of the bed. Her legs simply seemed to have given way as she read those words. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I heard his voice. She said to herself, have I missed the day? Did I harden my heart? Could this really be happening? Could this really be true? Sue desperately hoped that this was not true. She hoped that maybe they have all just gone out for a walk, but but all day? There needs to be another explanation. She tried calling her nephew again, but nothing has changed. His phone diverted to a message bank. She got her phone out and this time she did not ignore the breaking news. It seems the Pope has died over a serious injury sustained in a car crash where his chauffeur-driven limousine collided with an oncoming vehicle at 10.45am in Rome. The driver seems to have survived the accident but could not be found at the scene. For some reason, Sue was expecting something different. Her brother spoke about this rapture and that the world would try to hide it or excuse it. Sue hoped that it was not the rapture of the church but searched frantically to find some news about people disappearing, but found nothing on Google. Sue remembers hearing about this as being an event so great that the world could not possibly hide it. Planes falling from the sky, trains crashing, etc. But today, most planes are flying and landing on autopilot. Trains are almost all self-driving, and so too are many cars. How can she find out what has happened to her family? A thought came to her mind and she quickly pulled back the covers to her niece's bed. To her complete horror, she sees her niece's nightgown laying flat under her bed quilt. Sue runs to her brother's room and does the same thing and found the same result. But more than this, she also sees her brother's wedding ring 
to the side of his pillow. She recalls her brother telling her he never removes his wedding band, not even at night. Yet there it is on his bed, not on the bedside table, but on the side of his pillow. Sue sees her brother's Bible on the bedside. She notes the ribbon deep into the, into the end of the, of the Bible and takes hold of the book, opening it where the ribbon marks the page. There are no markings in his Bible, but she reads at the top of the open page quietly to herself and then reads it again and falls to the floor in tears and great grief. It was as if the curtains opened and the beaming light of the sun just sprang in through which all the dust floating in the room could now be seen with clarity. Sue now recalls to her mind so much of what has been told her, but her willful blindness would not permit her to accept it. She picked up the Bible that fell to the floor with her and read the verse again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Friends, it'll be said among the heathen that the Lord reigns. Psalm 96 makes it clear that this time of judgment is to reveal God to the world and the world will know it. The Bible says that all of creation groans and travails until he comes. So it should not be surprising that the text that speaks of his coming also says this. Again, Psalm 96, have a look. Remember, the Bible says in the book of Romans that the, all creation groans and travails until the coming of the Lord. It shouldn't surprise us to see all of a sudden the heavens rejoice. Have a look there at verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful in all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, before, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Today, as we go through what we are going through today, it's not clear if God is judging the world for its sin or this is simply the natural result of man's sin. Lies and deceptions never have a good end. It's the same with the wildfires. You've seen the wildfires happening around the world. We see them happening here in Australia. And there's people who say this is the judgment of God. Well, is it? Not necessarily. It's not something that we can point to that direction. Why? Because 87% of these fires are, 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 are lit by man. 87% are man-made fires. And more than half of those are deliberately lit, not just through negligence. But there's a time coming when all people will know God is the one who is judging. And many people are going to shake their fist at him. They're going to blaspheme him. They're going to despise him all the more in their heart. They will know that it is God. But let that not be you, please. Let that not be you. If you're enduring this time, if you're going through this time, please. These judgments aren't designed just to punish you for no reason. These are there to humble you, to recognize who God is and to turn to him with all of your heart. And if you won't do so, then you're going to be the subject of that wrath and the object of that wrath. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. If you were left behind, depending on when you see or hear this sermon, there are a lot of things to watch out for and things that are going to occur and I'll endeavour to show some of those and where you can find them in the Bible. But there is one thing that you need to do and you need to do that right at this moment and that is to believe the gospel. If the rapture is done and the church is gone and you are left behind to endure what the Bible refers to as the time of Jacob's trouble, that day of wrath, yet you can still be wonderfully rescued if you believe that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Please, if there is still life in you, God has limited a certain day. It's not too late. Please, today, 
if you will hear his voice. Harden not your hearts, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these things, dear Lord, and these days that are so evidently upon our doorstep, Lord, are days of just incredible opportunity and hope for those people to see that these things are winding up and that they might soften their hearts and that we're not hardened and they might believe the gospel. And I, I just want to take that opportunity, dear Lord, to share the joy and the hope of Christ through this message and whatever way, dear Lord, it, it goes from house to house and that people would hear. And I ask and I pray, dear Lord, that you would soften hearts, that they would believe the wonderful simplicity that is in Christ. I pray, dear Lord, that it would touch their hearts and that they might be saved. And I ask you, dear Lord, that you would go before us all and your spirit would do the work that needs to be done within people's hearts and lives. We thank you for this opportunity. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.